Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Deirdre McCloskey, a distinguished professor of economics, history, English and communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. We talk about the economics discipline and what Keynes meant by a person is only an economist is not going to be a very good economist, as well as Deirdre's views on greed and envy, liberalism and equality. We also talk about Deirdre's gender crossing and what she experienced at the time. You can check out all the links, resources and books mentioned by Deirdre at economicrockstar.com forward slash Deirdre McCloskey. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. My sister tried three times to have me committed because she thought I was crazy. She's a professor of psychology, so she had standing in court to do that and succeeded twice. Now we are back on good terms. My my mother had no trouble at all. She was wonderful. It took her five minutes to adjust. and There was no sign of this. No one knew except my former wife that I was a cross-dresser occasionally, not very often. I think that enrichment is the solution to pollution. And enrichment of the average is the solution to the, the important part of the inequality. If ordinary people have a go, you, you get masses of innovation. That's the key. That's, that's the connection between freedom and economic growth. If you let people try things out in the, in, in the way that um, a free society does, it turns out that they don't need to be supervised by the duke or the king or the army or the estate. They do very well, thank you very much. And in warfare, you can't just do incentives. People didn't go over the top at the Somme, large numbers of Irish people, by the way, um, because they were going to get a medal. That's not why they, they, they did it. They, they, they did it for love of their comrades, for love of their country, for love of honor. And, and, and you're not going to understand the Battle of the Somme Uh, if you don't understand something other than prudence. You know, it's not to soften the science. It's to harden the science. And we've got to stop talking about this softening. That's not going to persuade the guys to take this stuff seriously. It's harder to do it correctly than to do it by going on and on with, with game theory and Max U. That it's harder to be, well, as, as Keynes said, a, a person who's only an economist is not going to be a very good economist. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I am so honored to have Deirdre McCloskey join me today. Hi, Deirdre. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you, Deirdre? Deirdre McCloskey taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago and was a distinguished professor of economics, history, English, and communication. She was also adjunct professor of philosophy and classics there, and for five years was a visiting professor of philosophy at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Since October 2007, Deirdre has received six honorary doctorates. In 2013, she received the Julian L. Simon Memorial Award for the Competitive Enterprise Institute for her work examining factors in history that led to advancement in human achievement and prosperity. Deirdre's main research interests include the origins of the modern world, the misuse of statistical significance in economics and other sciences, and the study of capitalism, among many others. Deirdre has written 17 books and around 400 scholarly pieces on topics ranging from technical economics and statistical theory to transgender advocacy and the ethics of the bourgeois virtues. Her latest book, Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas, Not Capital or Institutions, Enrich the World, is part of the Bourgeois Era trilogy, described as an apology for capitalism. Deirdre describes herself as a postmodern, quantitative free market feminist, Episcopalian, Midwestern, gender crossing literary woman. And all her information can be found on DeirdreMcCloskey.com. Deirdre, I met you recently here in Ireland at the Kilconomics Festival. And I was immensely engrossed in the conversation that you had with Nassim Taleb and Rory Sutherland on stage. Yeah. 
you talked about having a skin in the game and how that type of thinking and that type of attitude would, because it puts you into a situation whereby you have to perform and be true to yourself and true to a discipline, say, for example, like economics. How does that type of thinking play into the work that you have done, for example, on statistical testing and or your attitude towards the economics profession? Well, I think that um, having skin in the game is not seen as it should be part of, so to speak, the scholarly life, that it should matter how things come out in your science. And if if all you're interested in is um, is pumping up your CV and adding publications, then you stop thinking in 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 a serious way about your your scientific argument or your economic argument. And I think that's uh, that's bad for the science, and it's also bad for the world. I once did did a book in 1990 called "If You're So Smart: The Narrative of Economic Expertise." It was all about this idea that if um, if these experts were so smart, they'd be rich. So there must be something wrong with their claim of expertise if, if they haven't got skin in the game. And I recently interviewed Beatrice Cherrier, and we discussed the history, the recent history of economics. And she felt that madamitization of economics started back in, I think it was MIT, with Paul Samuelson, who um, developed this type of approach because he had a, a certain background, mathematics background, and introduced economics into the department there. And whether they're gatekeepers for journals, we have that mathematization of economics ever since the 50s or 40s, perhaps. Yeah. And you're quite critical somewhat of statistical significance and how that has almost numbed the conversation that we should have in economics, especially a philosophical one. Well, I'm not, I'm not critical of ma- mathematics per se in, ma- in economics or of, uh, the, uh, of statistical theory, which I admire and, and has very good uses in science. But what I do object to is a, is a mechanical view of the society that comes out if, if all you know is the math. If, if you don't know the history or, as you say, the, the philosophy, if you haven't thought deeply about um, economic behavior and economic life, then you're going to you're going to have this 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 fun machine that's going to boyish game of playing with the math, and you're going to forget that you're actually trying to understand a real economic world. Economists these days, in what I call Samuelsonian economics, because it is Paul Samuelson who invented it. Uh, that, by the way, Paul was my uh, mother's longtime mixed doubles tennis partner. <laughs> so he's a he's he's a nice man, but he, he was a nice man, and it had to be tried. This ma- mathematical approach. His um, his his, his brother in law is Kenneth Arrow, who was also a, you know, a very important figure in this, um, starting in the nineteen the early nineteen fifties. But it, you know, it's. I, 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 there are some parts of mathematics that economists should use more. I think they should use simulation, for example, more than they do, and they should use uh, applied mathematics in a in a serious way. But they don't use math the way the physicists and geologists and chemists do. They use it the way the professors in mathematics do, which is to prove things. And you can't prove great social truths on a blackboard. You can model, sometimes interestingly, how an economy works or how part of it works. But then to actually know that that's how it works, you have to go to the facts. You can't just stay on the blackboard. And that, so it's, it, it's actually blackboard economics which was in existence long before economics became very mathematical. That's the problem. The, the great economist Joseph Schumpeter called it the Ricardian vice after David Ricardo in the early 19th century, who did think he could pr- prove great social um, truths by just standing and thinking. 
these are perhaps one of the vices that you mentioned in your book, The Vices of e- Economists. Yeah. And there, you outlined, say, three bad habits. And one of those is your bad statistics you've just covered and bad theory and bad applications of statistics to public affairs. Yeah. And this type of, I suppose, masculinity, yeah. as you mentioned, in the profession. Yeah. And hopefully we're getting better at this. And I don't know, I can't speak, but... To be honest, I might appear as if I'm kind of, how could I say, biased in that most of my guests are male. And I don't know whether that's because of the profession in which it's mostly dominated by males. It is is the the profession, like chemistry, which is also highly male-dominated. Economics is is a boyish field, a kind of male field. And that comes out, as you said, in some of the theorizing, which is, uh, for example, game theory, which is a... a very important part of economics these days, at least if you look at the economics journals, is um, very boyish, very adolescent in its joys and its its fun, and it's kind of endless. It's a game. It's like playing uh, playing chess. And when the issue of how few female economists there are comes up, if there is a pause in the conversation, I always say, "Well, I've done my part." <laughs> In 1995, I changed from being Donald to being Deirdre, and uh, so I've, I've improved the improved the ratio slightly. In fact, when my dean, when I told my dean back at the, at the University of Iowa where I was teaching then that I was going to change gender, he said, "Oh, great! This will be wonderful for our affirmative action. Up one, down another." And you shared another one where you were talking about income inequalities too. <laughs> right he said oh boy i can i can cut your salary 70 cents on the dollar he also said oh god i i'm so glad i thought you were going to confess to confess to converting to socialism (laughs) and uh, i know i laughed there but it's sad that there's this inequality that does exist in modern day society yeah well i don't know i don't agree i've i've actually written recently about inequality because everyone does these days and i take the view that um the big problem facing society, the economy, is not either inequality or the environment. Now, you'll hear people saying that the biggest problem we face is the changing Gini coefficient, or the biggest problem we face is global warming. The The biggest problem that humanity faces is the one it's always faced and is overcoming, which is poverty. If If, if we grow... If, if most countries in the world would grow the way Ireland grew in the last part of the, uh, of the 20th century, a lot of the other problems like inequality and uh, at least inequality of real comfort and environmental problems would go away. We imagine what's going to happen when the 40% of humankind in China and India which are growing per year at 6 to 10% per year in real terms, when their engineers flood onto the world intellectual marketplace and start devising, as they're very interested in doing, both countries, ways of, say, capturing carbon dioxide from the air. I, I think that enrichment is the solution to pollution. And enrichment of the average is the solution to the, the important part of the inequalities that we have. I don't care how many diamond rings some uh, millionaire has. I care that ordinary people have access to education and health care and, and adequate food and opportunities for um, uh, travel and so on. And that's what's actually happened in, in the rich countries like Ireland. And that's very important, especially... If we talk about that freedom and that liberty that we should all have, yeah, and obviously we don't want to take someone's diamonds and distribute them to somebody else because well, it, they're pretty much worthless. Obviously, there's well, value well, to it, but they're not going to give you good. Yeah, answer. and and what and what what people think is true is not true. They think that if you were to take away the diamonds and 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 sell them and then give money to the poor that that would substantially help the poor, and it doesn't. If you just do the arithmetic, it turns out that economic growth, again of the sort that Ireland experienced in the last uh, half century, is what really helps the poor. 
it's it's that the, 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 I mean, here's what I mean. The magnitude is so much larger. Since 1800, income per head in a country like Ireland or or uh, Japan or Sweden, the United States, has increased. Now hear this: three thousand percent over the base. Three thousand percent, a factor of thirty. Now. <laughs> It's it's kind of obvious that you you can't take one and increase it three thousand percent through redistribution. It's not going to do it. You have to make the pie larger. Chopping up the pie in a in a in a different way may or may not be desirable, but it's not going to really solve the problem of, um, of of serious poverty. What solves the problem of poverty is indeed uh, economic growth. Obviously, there's a cause to economic growth. And you disagree with a lot of economists, say, for example, Thomas Piketty. I do. Perhaps Smid and Marx. If you want yeah, to elaborate on that, I'd love yeah. to, for you to share it with us. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I did a long review, which is available on the web, website, which, which, by the way, is org, not .com. Although if you just do Deirdre McCluskey, you'll find it. Anyway, I, I did a long review of, of Piketty's book, a long, respectful review. I'm not contemptuous of his work, which I think is serious, but I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong on ethical grounds, and I think it's wrong on economic grounds and historical grounds. So, and even very good scientists make mistakes, so it's, I'm not saying he's a bad man. But what's wrong is that what we should be focusing on is those equalities I talked about earlier of of, of um, access to education, access to health care, access to food and shelter and clothing and so on. And those, those have been transformed by economic growth. When I first came to Ireland in 1973, uh, Ireland was a third world country, um, uh, a priest ridden and poor. When I came back, the next time I came back to Ireland was 1996. And O'Connell Street was thronged with uh, well-to-do Irish people. So uh, th- that's the transformation that we need to solve um, uh, poverty. And, and Marx, although I, I say I anger my my conservative friends by noting that Marx was the greatest social scientist of the 19th century without compare, I then anger my friends uh, on the left by saying, but he got everything wrong. <laughs> Uh, which is why I haven't got any friends. Um, <laughs> but almost everything that Marx said was uh, that he thought was going to happen didn't happen, and people were ordinary people weren't immiserized. The rate of profit of capital did not fall. Uh, almost it, actually, the one thing that Marx got right is something that that distinguished him from a lot of the other classical economists, which he believed that there, he and, and Engels believed that there was great technological improvement, whereas a lot of the others, and John Stuart Mill and Ricardo and so forth, didn't didn't see that happening very much. So that that was his 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 good um, his, his his good prediction, but for most part, for the most part, he was wrong. And then on the environmental side, which has become so fashionable in the left the last 30 years or so, last 20 years especially, since the fall of communism, um, is equally mistaken. It keeps predicting the end of the world. People keep saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling environmentally. And it's just not so. Um, again, when I was a child in, in Boston in the 1940s, you could run your finger along the windowsill every night, and it would it would come up black from the coal smoke that we used to heat our houses in those days. And that's that's no longer true. The solution to pollution, to make a poem, is economic growth. Rich people don't tolerate a bad environment, and they have the money to fix it, like Denmark, for example, and they have the engineers and the scientists who know how to do it. So in every way, the way forward is to get the kind of quick economic growth that uh, China and India are, are having. And then, then, we can, then we can solve these problems of 
inequality and uh, and the environment. And with this economic growth, it tends to go hand in hand with, say, more freedom and also more entrepreneurial activity and the generation of new ideas and innovations. Sure. Well, it's it's caused by the new ideas and innovation. Yeah. But the key point is we, we, we don't have to have rich people favoring policies to get entrepreneurship. What we need is what we got in some countries in the, in the, in the 19th century, which is the amazing, the amazing experiment of liberalism, what Adam Smith called the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. And by equality, he meant equality of social standing, not equality of final income. By liberty, he meant the right to choose the occupation you want to go into and to start a business anytime you want. And by, by justice, he meant equal justice before the law. And those alone, if you give them to people, have a remarkable result. It was an experiment, as I say, it was new in the 19th century. Ordinary people become extraordinary. They, as the as the English say, it's not an American um, way of talking. They have a go, you know. And if ordinary people have a go, you you get masses of innovation. That's the key. That's that's the connection between freedom and economic growth. If you let people try things out in the in, in the way that um, a free society does. It turns out that they don't need to be supervised by the duke or the king or the army or the estate. They do very well, thank you very much. There's so many questions going through my head now that I want to throw at you, Deirdre. And I think I'll actually ask one regarding relating that last point that you made to economic theory. I was just thinking of the production possibility frontier where an abstract sure. version of the economy and two countries trading to goods and ending up at a more, what used to be an unattainable point. Yeah, that's there's right. Nowhere, yeah, there's nowhere there really that discusses this type of freedom or these type of ideas. Um, that's right. What, what's that's wrong? exactly right. Because, he, well, here's what I say. I'm an economist, a free market economist, so I'm certainly in favor of free trade. I think it's a shame that uh, Donald Trump is going to do these stupid things that he's about to do. But uh, on the other hand, think of that diagram that you were imagining in your mind. That only gets you a little bit outside the production possibility curve, desirable though it is. You get a little, you know, you get some foreign goods uh, come in cheaper and you sell your goods and in exchange for these foreign goods and that allows you to consume more. So that's all to the good. But it's the order of magnitude is very small by comparison with a factor of 30. By comparison with anywhere from 3,000 to, to um, 10,000 percent, which is what modern economic growth has been for the last couple of centuries, these gains, these static gains from trade, these little efficiencies that we always talk about in economics one or in, in, uh, in microeconomics are small potatoes. The big potatoes, so to speak, are the ideas for massively increasing the potato crop, uh, to continue the, the, that image, the, the biological ideas that allowed you to prevent a potato blight, for example, and the ideas that, that raise the productivity of agriculture by the, the enormous amount that it has in the last uh, 150 years, those are what we don't explain in economics. Those are outside the static model. So, I mean, this isn't an indictment of the static model. It's, it's good for lots of purposes. But it's not good for explaining the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. That has to rely on the amazing stimulus to human ingenuity that a free society gives. You mentioned a couple of virtues. I, I, I'm sure you could call them virtues that Adam Smith explained, liberty, equality, and justice. And in another article, you also added to these like prudence and then the Christianity virtues, as you might like to call them. Yeah. And unfortunately, in economics, 
I don't know where it's coming from, whether it's because of the male dominance and all of these classical e- economists tend to be um, mostly male. Yeah. We talk about rationality, removing the emotion and the feelings. Yeah. There's very little talk of uh, love in in economic theory yeah. and how that might impact people's behaviours or perhaps influence you in terms of decision making. And Well, it does. It does. I actually speak of the, the seven the principal virtues. I speak of the four pagan virtues, so-called, or the cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and and above all, prudence. And then I speak of the so-called theological virtues, or the Christian virtues, not that Christians actually practice them very much, of hope and faith and love. And you add those together, four plus three equals seven, and then other virtues like honesty or, or integrity and so on, those are all combinations of these these primary colors of the ethical life. And then the corresponding vices. For example, prudence by itself, which is the virtue that economics concerns itself with on the whole. Uh, if, if all you do is be prudent, all you do is maximize in the absence of love and, and temperance and justice, we have a name for that. It's called greed. And it's not true that greed is good. Greed is bad. Um, greed is a sin. And we don't need greed to make the economy work well, contrary to some what some economists say these days. What we need is a, a balance of the virtues. You know, in, in any enterprise, a business or, or a business deal even, and certainly a family, um, or, a, or, or a government office, if there's not a certain amount of love in the office, I know it, in, it embarrasses men to talk about it, but if there's not a certain amount of love, that organization doesn't work well. You can put all the incentives you want. Oliver Williamson got a Nobel Prize for talking about the incentives within an organization. But that's very nice, and I'm not against that. But if all you do is the prudent incentives, people maximizing, oh, look, if you do well, I'll give you a bonus at Christmas. If that's all you do and and you haven't got any of these other virtues in play, uh, um, temperance and justice and and hope and faith and love and and, and courage, indeed, as in an entrepreneur – you're, you're going to have a, a badly functioning organization, and if it's in general, you're going to have a badly functioning economy. Totally agree. Absolutely. Why do we reserve uh, things like this, our discussions like this with philosophy, or not even philosophy, but sociology or psychology? Why not integrate it into the economics discipline? I completely agree with you. I mean, look, if, if we can't explain the great enrichment from 1800 to the present with the prudence-only tools of economics, that production possibility curve you talked about, viewed in a static way, or the, or the incentives that, that Douglas North talked about in new institutional economics. If we can't explain it that way, then maybe it's better to expand the science to include, well, let's, let's talk about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is clearly about prudence, you can't be a fool and a successful entrepreneur in the end. But on the other hand, you also need courage. And you need the virtue of hope. Hope is the virtue of having a project. It's not, not kind of sappy, oh, everything's going to turn out right. That's not the point. The point is having a project. If you really are hopeless and don't have a project in your life, you go home this afternoon and shoot yourself. So uh, hope, and in, in whereas the faith is not just going to church on Sunday. It's also having an identity, being Irish and being being a woman and being a, 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 a sister and so forth. And th- those, th- those matters, especially hope, courage, and prudence, are the virtues of the entrepreneur. Uh, on the other hand, the virtues of the um, successful manager the person who makes takes an organization and brings it to a new level of of excellence are very very often on the more feminine side. They're the virtues of temperance and justice 
and prudence and love, those make an organization better. Whereas the entrepreneur on the other side makes a new organization. So you, you can see that both are needed, both the masculine and the feminine side of these, these virtues are needed. And the, and the top and the bottom, the top being these so-called theological virtues of hope, faith, and love, spiritual love, and the bottom being things like prudence and temperance. Previous guests that I've spoken to, Nancy Fulbright and Shosanna Grossbard. They're, 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 they are both old friends of mine. Oh, are they? Yes, they are indeed. That, that was the really the last time I talked about this type of yeah. economic thinking. Yeah, that's the problem. It's it's women who tend to talk about this. Um, Nancy and Shoshana have spent their lives talking about this kind of thing. And, and the men say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And then they go on to prudence-only models, more game theory. And it's just got to stop. It's just kind of silly. Let's go back to game theory for a moment. Non-cooperative game theory, as it's called, is, is well-named. And it's the dominant form. And it says that all that people care about is maximizing their own utility. Except the, um, the scientific fact is that when you do experiments with people, to a remarkable degree, they do not follow that rule. Well, only to a remarkable degree if you're a kind of boyish guy who thinks that everyone's out to screw everyone else. The actual fact is that people are humans. <laughs> people are people. And they have got love as well as prudence. They've got a balance of these virtues. And I think that that, I think both Sh- Shoshana and Nancy would emphatically agree with me, and our, more exactly, I agree with them because they were thinking these thoughts before I did. Um, that a balance of the masculine and, and the feminine virtues is how a successful society works. Is the key to spreading this type of thinking more to, to do with writing for the mainstream? Because I'm quite constrained in terms of what I have to teach, even though I'm quite disillusioned with the discipline. And I've only, over the last number of years, become disillusioned by perhaps maturing in terms of my thinking sure. and how this type of application of principles is quite, is quite. how could I put it? I don't want to say ridiculous, but that's the first thing that came to my mind. No, but it's not, it's not incorrect. It's, it's fine to apply uh, principles. I'm in favor of logic and I'm in favor of mathematics and in favor of being, being rigorous. But if you're rigorous on the basis of an um, extremely shallow model of, of humanity, namely maximize utility subject to constraints, and that's all you ever do, then you're going to get an awful lot of problems wrong. Some of them, you're, you, you, no, no, honestly, I, I'm a Chicago school economist, among other things, Austrian too, I do all kinds of things. <laughs> I, uh, but there are some situations in which maximize utility subject constraints is all you ought to care about. If you're talking about um, uh, covered interest arbitrage in the foreign exchange market, believe me, you, you don't need to worry about love. <laughs> but, but, but in so many other parts of the economy, you do need to worry about love. As I said, in a, if an organization, a small an office is going to work well, there's got to be a certain amount of respect for people, which um, you could call uh, love or, 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 or justice, um, or else it'll just disintegrate into a cartoon volume of a uh, version of the corporation or the, or the office. And, and um, if you're going to be studying, as economists after Gary Becker do, as Shanna does, the economics of the family, and you ignore love, uh, well, that's going to be kind of crazy. Um, Gary Becker, in his classic paper that uh, outlined the theory of marriage, said, well, there are some people who say that marriage has something to do with love. And he put the word love in scare quotes <laughs> throughout the paper. No way. Every time he mentioned love, he put it in quotation marks, as though it was kind of silly and feminine to think of marriage having to do with love. 
Well, you, you can see that analytically you're going to get a lot of things wrong in, in predictions. You're going to, in policy, you're going to get a lot of things wrong. Let's go back to this, this character, Oliver Williamson, excellent economist who deserved the Nobel Prize. But his view of how you make an organization work is that you give incentives. And if that's all you do, you're treating people like trained rats. Yes. And it turns out that if you treat people like trained rats, they start acting like rats. If you don't appeal to their humanity in, in an organization, uh, it doesn't work. And, and, and actually, soldiers have always known this since the, well, I guess human beings have always had warfare. And in warfare, you can't just do incentives. People didn't go over the top, but the some large numbers of Irish people, by the way, um, because they were going to get a medal. That's not why they, they, they did it. They, they, they did it for love of their comrades, for love of their country, for love of honor. And, and, and you're not going to understand the Battle of the Somme uh, if you don't understand something other than prudence. Yes. I would love to ask you, Deirdre, about how we can not soften the subject in economics, but to encourage that side of things that we were just discussing and integrate it into the classroom. Well, here's one thing to do. Bring novels and films into the classroom. That works. I've done it myself. For example, the, the great American novel by John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath, is a, is a novel that every American ought to have read. Now, and it talks, it's about the economy from beginning to end. Now, John Steinbeck was not an economist, and he didn't understand economics, whether micro or macro, very well. But even, even in his mistakes, he's interesting. And uh, it lets people see that the economy is about real human life. It's not just about things on a blackboard. But, you know, it's not to soften the science. It's to harden the science. And we've got to stop talking about this softening. That's, that's not going to that's not going to persuade the guys to take this stuff seriously. It's harder to do it correctly than to do it by going on and on with with game theory and Max U. That it's harder to be well as as Keynes said, a, a person who's only an economist is not going to be a very good economist. And I think that's correct. You need to be a statistician and a mathematician, of course, and I'm not against that. But you also need to be a historian and a philosopher and a sociologist and a psychologist and a, a serious person who knows the world. And the, the way we know the world is mainly through the humanities, through theology, through religion, through um, novels, through poetry, song, country music where the river meets the road, through films, through gossip, through going to a football game with our mates. That's how we learn how societies really work. And it's harder to bring that to bear, our human experience, into the economic science. But to get a good economic science, I think any thoughtful person agrees you have to have all of that. I'm just thinking of a number of guests that I have on the show that actually hit that. And one, one that seems to stand out to me is uh, Herbert Gintis. And sure. He's, uh, yeah, he sure. Is Herb amazing. is an old friend of mine, too. Oh. Yeah, Herb, Herb is, uh, yeah. yeah how, how did you find Herb Gintis? Um, yeah, I can't recall, but I reached out to him anyway. I, he has his own website, too. And I reached out to him, and he was more than willing and happy to come on, and I was blown away by his knowledge. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a very intelligent guy. Herb is, is a little bit hung up on the Max Hughes stuff, but he and, and Sam Bowles, his friend, who actually, I ju just quite remarkably, about three weeks ago, I heard a lecture by Sam Bowles in China, in Shanghai. I was there for a few weeks, and Sam happened to be coming through. But Bowles and Gintis have both moved beyond the, the simplest sort of Samuelsonian Max Hughes stuff very considerably. They conclude, now these, both of these guys were once dogmatic Marxists, well, they're so smart that they weren't ever dogmatic, but they were Marxists when they were kids, when I knew them as graduate students. 
and they've gotten over it. And one thing they've discovered with some colleagues is that commercial societies are more honest than non-commercial societies. They've done a large international study of this. And I, actually, this thing I heard Sam Bowles talking about three weeks ago was inequality. And Sam, through careful measurement, decided that most societies have the same amount of equality regardless. Now, he drew the conclusion that we need to then massively redistribute, but that's not, <laughs> that's just a, a residue of his Marxism. So the, these these guys, Gintis and Bowles and, and Shoshana and, and all the others, these are real scientists. They're trying to find out how the world really works. Deirdre, a recent guest I had on the last week's show is a student of mine. He's an undergrad student, Jonathan McAvoy. And I was interested in his own personal thought process uh-huh. in terms of his economics. And he's trying to discover and move away from the types of sure. uh, thinking that he reads or in textbooks. And he touched on one of the things that you mentioned on greed, and you were saying greed is bad. And he's he yeah. had to he wanted to find his own argument in terms of what he believes greed is, or in terms of capitalism. I think he's got it. He you know like smart young men, especially you should urge him to read stuff. If you if you want to understand ethics, you've got to read Saint Thomas Aquinas, and you've got to read uh, you know beyond what you can figure out by sitting in your room and thinking. But greed is a corrosive sin. And greed, you might say, this is one way to put it, is the conservative sin. It's the sin of the conservatives. And envy is the sin of the socialists. And both of them are corrosive of the, of the human soul. Either one. Oh, you know, there have been lots of poems. I can I can name you the poems that have said this, and then endless philosophers have said it, and 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 theologians, and it's correct. What happens in both greed and envy is that possessions take the place. If you allow me, I am a Christian to take the place of God, or to take the place to put it more generally of some dignified transcendent outside yourself. Both of them are selfish. The socialist looking up and thinking how terrible it is that Lillian Betancourt has a Rolex watch for every day of the month, another one. And the conservative looking down, thinking um, how contemptible it is that those poor people have any money at all. Neither of these is good for the human spirit. Dirt, I'd love to know how you got into economics or yeah, how you decided to choose economics as your career path? Well, I, I, I started as a Marxist. I was a kind of soft Marxist. I call myself a Joan ba- at those times when I was 16 or 17, a Joan Baez Marxist. I sang labor songs. And by the way, I sang uh, Clancy Brothers uh, Irish songs too. But then I started to study economics and I became a Keynesian because that's what was on offer in Harvard at the time, and then I became a kind of a economic engineer. I, I was a transportation economist, and then I gradually started to see the the power of the Chicago School way of talking. In fact, my first job was twelve years at the university, teaching at the University of Chicago, and that's where I truly learned economics. But then I, I saw that there was a certain narrowness on the Harvard Keynesian side and the Chicago Monitor side, they were both narrow in their method. And then I I got interested in what I call the rhetoric of economics, how economists persuade each other. And from that, I, I finally got to the rhetoric of the economy how people speak to each other and how important it is in in, econo- in the functioning of an economy. And then I became a, a woman and a Christian. I think of myself as a Anglican church lady. And I saw the force of ethics generally in the economy, how we speak about each other in particular. And that's what the theme of my last book is, that this last volume in the trilogy is that it's the change that happened that brought about the equality of liberalism and this astonishing explosion of innovation is a spiritual and ethical change
change of how we view other people. Not so much, not, it's not like Max Weber thinking, imagining a psychological change within the, the breast of the entrepreneur. No, it's not that. It's how people talked about each other that changed. And we allowed each other to have a go, and the result was the modern world. Is this type of interaction that we have with one another being suppressed? Is there a danger of that being suppressed now, or do you think well, we have no... No. I don't think so. I, I, you know, there are in reaction to the great, re, the great recession, as happened in a more extreme form in the 1930s. People have lost faith in the market to a degree. Most economists don't pay any attention to it, but still, most politicians and ordinary people have lost faith in the market. So liberalism is under attack everywhere. This, this populism that we see all over the place is anti-liberal above all. But I believe that in the long run, all societies will become liberal democracies. And the reason is the incredible magnitude of the economic gain from adopting liberal policies, as in Singapore, as in Hong Kong, as in South Korea, and Taiwan, as in Botswana, as in most spectacularly China and India. And then in the longer, if, if I can persuade people, in the longer sweep of history, I'd make the same point about Holland in the 17th century and, and uh, England and Scotland in the 18th and the, and the New World. And, and th this liberal experiment that we engaged in then and is being repeated now in China and India is so productive that I think it will win in the end. Deirdre, can I ask you about your transgender experience, if you don't mind to discuss sure, that. Sure, I, I, well, I, I, I wrote a, a book on the subject yeah. called Crossing, a memoir, so I haven't got any secrets. Ask away. Yeah, I, firstly, I'd love to know how difficult it was for you back in society at that point in time. Did anybody understand? Was there any groups that you could talk to, to, I suppose, to be yourself? Well... I know in Ireland, yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, what's the situation in Ireland? Well, in Ireland, for example, a referendum was put to the people to vote for same-sex marriage. And I think we yeah. were the first in the world, perhaps the second, I don't know, who actually, through a referendum, we decided that this yeah. was all good. And, you know, we have extreme religious people saying the Irish people are going to all burn and all this yeah, yeah. nasty attitude. Sure. We haven't done so. We haven't done so. Nothing. Everything's still good. Yeah. Um, and society is still very much... In, in many parts of the world, ignorant of this. Oh, extremely hostile, yeah, dangerously hostile. Well, I, I of course, had the big advantage, as, as anyone does in, in, a, in a liberal society, of being in Holland, where I was the first year as a woman was in Holland, and then in the United States. And Can I, sorry, can I ask you how liberating that was for you? Oh, tremendously. I mean, I... I it's not that I was a sad sack before. I was a guy and I had a happy marriage for 30 years and two, two grown children, um, by the way, who haven't spoken to me since I changed gender. It's been, that's the only bad news. The, the part of the world that gave me the most trouble, actually, is my immediate family. Um, my sister tried three times to have me committed because she thought I was crazy. She's a pr professor of psychology, so she had standing in court to do that, and she succeeded twice. Right. Now we are back on good terms. My, my my mother had no trouble at all. She was wonderful. It took her five minutes to adjust, and there was no sign of this. No one knew except my former wife that I was a cross dresser occasionally, not very often. And then I, in 1995, I it I twigged. And I, I realized that what I had wanted from age 11, I could have and should have. And for the most part, because I, I work at it, so to speak, I, I want to be a woman, and I try to act like a woman. My voice is hopeless. I, I had an operation that was ill-advised, and that didn't work. But still, you know, I can always say it. I smoke uh, 
40 cigarettes a day and drink a quart of whiskey, and that's why I have this voice. <laughs> uh, but the, I don't go out of my way to be in between the genders. I don't want that. I want to be a woman. So, as I said before, I'm, I'm a church lady. I bring cookies to church, and I, and I know that, that there's a social role for women, and I, and I do it. That doesn't mean I'm happy to be, be discriminated against, as I am as a woman. Uh, the first time this happened to me, I was in Holland and standing with a group of economists, all men except for me, and they all knew about me. And I made a point, and they ignored me. Two minutes later, George made the same point, and all the men turned to George and said, oh, George, that's a wonderful point. You ought to get an, an, an article out of that. You'll get the Nobel Prize. And I said to myself, yes, they're treating me like a woman. <laughs> in ignoring me. That was the first time and the last time I've enjoyed the experience. But it's illustrative of, of the job I'm, I've undertaken, which is to change gender, to actually change. I'm not making some political statement about a third gender or something like that. I'm, I'm, I, I, every cell in my body says I'm still male. X, Y genes, I can't do anything about it, but I can take the social role of a woman and do. So on the street, I pass now. In the first year, I didn't. And I just go through life as a woman. It works just fine. And I think you're absolutely, you look absolutely amazing. Well, thank you, dear. You're very kind to say so. Deirdre, I usually ask our guests a number of quick questions, if you don't mind. Well, not quick questions, but questions that you could answer quickly. <laughs> I will. I'll answer them all quickly. I would love to know if you could step into the DeLorean and time travel. <laughs> What era would you go back to? Who would you like to meet? And what conversation would you have with them? Well, of course, it depends what social class I was in, but I'd like to go back to the 19th century and talk to people like John Stuart Mill and, or indeed the 18th and, and uh, meet uh, David Hume and, and uh, my hero, Adam Smith. Also, I would like to know if you have, obviously going to recommend your books and I'll put the links to your books on my webpage. Do please. But do you have any recommended books you'd like to share with our listener? Well, the, the easiest approach to my thinking is a book called um, The, uh, well, no, maybe not. Um, yeah, let's see. Probably the best thing to do is to go to my website and look at the columns, the short essays and interviews that I've done. And those are kind of an easy way into my arguments. Yes, I actually seen that. It's on your uh, home page, and you have That's a couple right. of, um, I suppose, reviews. I have, I, have, I, I, have, I have the actual interviews in voice, but I also have they have them pr some of them printed where journalists would send me um, questions and I would answer them. And if you kind of do a few of those, you'll get a flavor for what it is I'm about. And then you should go buy all the books. <laughs> yes, of course. All, all 17 books. Yes, of course. And given the extensive collection of books that you have written, the 17 books and the many articles, yeah. do you have any writing tips? Well, surely you do. But what writing tips would you like to share with us? Well, I have a, I, actually, it turns out I have a book where I give all the writing tips. It's, <laughs> I didn't it, do my homework. It, it, it's called Economical Writing. And it's, it's cheap. It probably sells for 10 or $15 in Ireland. And uh, it has all the, all, all the tips you could want. I'm sometimes called the best writer in economics, which I find extremely embarrassing because um, I'm not that good a writer. I suppose it just shows how badly we are in economics in, in writing. Is there one, one writing tip that stands out to you? Or that well, yeah, let's see. One writing tip that stands out. Put pen to paper and keep going. Yes, I like that one. <laughs> Straightforward enough. Get, get your finger out and just work on it. Uh, Go for it. Yeah, it won't keep you long now. We're almost done, Deirdre. But uh, McCloskey is a an Irish name. You mentioned Ireland many times. You've been here a few times also. I do. Um, you obviously have ancestry here. I do. The name came over a man named Alexander McCluskey, suspiciously Protestant, I must say, from Ulster in the 1830s. But Irish married Irish in the United States for many, many generations. So I must have, have cousins all over Ireland. 
Deirdre, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you. Share it again with our listeners where they could find you. Well, well I mean, it, uh, the, the, the best place is my website, DeirdreMcCleskey.org. And there you have all my personal information and all my many of my writings. There, there's, there's a PDF of an old micro book that I wrote a long time ago and lots of other things. Lovely. You can find all the links to Deirdre on economicrockstar.com forward slash Deirdre McCloskey. Deirdre, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are an economic rock star. Thank you, dear. <laughs> thank you very much, Deirdre. Okay. And that's definitely not a masculine term. <laughs> well, there are some female rock stars, so that's okay. We know that, yeah. We have <laughs> Courtney Love. Keeping, keeping a team of love, you know, we have Courtney Love. Uh, yes, indeed. Rock stars, isn't indeed. And I might even see you at Kilconomics next year if you're around. Okay, okay, I'll be there, I'm almost sure. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, dear. Bye bye. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.